On California's north coast, hidden in the fog, lies Rockefeller Grove, home to the largest old-growth redwood forest in the world. Amazingly, salmon and redwoods co-evolved over many millennia, with salmon benefiting from the cold, protected habitats these forests provide, while redwoods are enriched by the marine-derived nutrients salmon runs would import. These nutrients also benefit the entire aquatic ecosystem, supporting the health and growth of all our native fish species. Originally, members of the Eel River Athapascan peoples, known as the Northern Sinkion, lived along the South Fork of the Eel River. In the early 1900s, early Californians and other settlers began exploring the stunning redwood forests of the North Coast. Harvest of the old growth redwoods began soon after and led to significant conservation efforts. In 1931, the newly formed Save the Redwoods League acquired the Rockefeller Forest around Bull Creek from the Pacific Lumber Company thanks to million-dollar donations from John D. Rockefeller Jr. and matching state funds. By the mid-20th century, this remote part of California was home to over 60,000 people, rapidly changing land uses and turning what were historically healthy ecosystems into watersheds ravaged by large floods. After World War II, the state of California incentivized timber harvesting by taxing standing trees. So landowners who didn't harvest their trees paid more in property taxes for those forests. And consequently, there was a real green rush of, of timber harvesting, particularly in the South Fork here, where we have a lot of second growth redwoods at that time um, that those timber companies came after. And so they just ravaged these forests. They, really just clear cut entire watersheds. And so they denuded the landscape and then we had some very catastrophic large magnitude floods. In 1955, a massive winter storm caused the Eel River to swell to over 540,000 cubic feet per second, flooding 90,000 acres and reaching almost 50 feet in some areas, wiping out entire towns. In response, State and conservation groups accelerated land purchases around the Eel River to protect the redwoods and fish habitats. Then in 1964, another even larger storm that exceeded 750,000 CFS nearly wiped out the town of Wiat, prompting more landowners to sell their properties and allowing Humboldt Redwood State Park to expand and protect more of the Bull Creek watershed. These were rain on snow events, which brought down just tons of water um, and sediment from the hillsides into the stream channels. In Bull Creek, the, the sediment coming off the hillsides filled the channel 10, 15, 20 feet deep in sediment. And when the flood receded, that sediment material stayed in the channel. So actually the Army Corps after the 64 flood brought bulldozers in and recreated a main stem channel by pushing some of that deposited sediment aside. And then they did a second treatment, which was bringing in rip wrapping, large one and two ton boulders. And they armored the banks on the side of the channel because they were trying to protect the old growth redwood trees that remained in this Rockefeller forest. The effect was leaving a, a Bull Creek main stem for many, many miles in this degraded condition. So there was about 10 to 12 feet of material deposited across this project site. Um, and we're trying to bring the level of the floodplain back so the channel can naturally migrate across it because sediment's not very sorted, which is important for spawning and rearing. Different species of fish use different size of gravels for spawning. Um, so by having wood and features that help scour out pools, smaller grain gravels deposit first. And so you're getting these pockets of different sized sorted gravels. Throughout the summer season, the contractors were working six days a week to excavate all of this flood deposited material. On the Hamilton Reach project site, deep off-channel pools were built to offer safe habitat for young fish during winter months. Floodplain channels were added to allow Bull Creek to help spread water during high flow events. What we're looking at here are very exciting, newly created habitat ponds and habitat channels, and then we're planting about 18,000 shrubs and trees and plants to help bring back that riparian forest so the water can cool and provide a better habitat for salmon. We're planting a lot of wetland plants in this habitat. So Juncus effusus, Juncus bolanderi, Carex bolanderi, and Juncus patens, and also Equisetum in these lower areas of the watershed. In addition to these ponds and side channels that are new habitat for aquatic species, 
There's also in stream, what we call engineered wood jams. It's not just a bunch of wood piled. Holes are driven into the bed of the stream and then they can structurally be held with a crib wall. And that way those can withstand what we call a hundred year flood event. Started working here in uh, late 1990s when I was working on my master's thesis and I've seen this particular site um, be very static. It's exciting to me to be able to lower those floodplain areas into an elevation that both the riparian ecologists and fisheries biologists say that will um, really increase the salmonid populations as well as recovery of the riparian floodplain. Cal Trout has been a really beneficial partner to find funding and to find a way to do what feels like an impossible task. It takes a huge team of people to make a project like this come together. And Parks has big dreams, but you can never do dreams by yourself. It takes a community and it takes people caring at a bigger picture and a smaller landscape level interaction. There's been a lot of restoration in the uh, upslope areas to retire roads, reduce sediment loads and contributions down into the main stem, but there hasn't been the effort to restore the main stem habitat. And so um, I felt like Caltrout could bring the capacity and the resources to help move forward some of that planning that needed to happen. You know, it just, it, it took us literally five years from, from start till now to raise enough funds to start this, even this first phase of, of floodplain restoration on Hamilton. Um, and so we've got at least three more phases of, of upper main stem floodplain restoration to do. And then we've got to tackle this main stem condition down in the Rockefeller forest, which is going to be really challenging because it's within the old growth forest. And so how do you get in there and do restoration with heavy equipment um, within this public setting where tourists come every year? So we've got some major challenges ahead, but um, you know, accomplishing this first phase is really important. I think the partnership with Parks and Caltrout has been really beneficial to improving California State Parks landscape. The state park owns and manages all the land that was previously um, extensively logged by clear cutting. And there were tons of roads that are now being decommissioned. So a lot of that sediment that was running off the roads and coming down and creating this big uh, mass of sediment that moved with floodwaters all of that is being restored slowly. And so it's the only sub watershed in the eel watershed that's entirely publicly owned and has this chance for renewal over time. So we can look at the impacts of this project for salmon habitat and other aquatic species. And then we'll have a good way to say, this plan worked here, let's apply it in other places where resources are also managed responsibly. Together, these efforts help maintain the delicate balance of this ancient ecosystem. Continued partnerships between state parks, other resource agencies, and conservation groups are essential in maintaining and restoring these valuable natural resources, ensuring the survival of not just the ancient redwoods, but also the complex ecosystems they support, including our native fish species and threatened salmon and steelhead populations.